Good evening. My name is Linda Reinhardt. I'm the president of the Janesville League of Women Voters. And on behalf of the Janesville League of Women Voters, the University of Wisconsin, Rock County, our co-sponsors, the League of Women Voters of Beloit, the League of Women Voters of the Whitewater area, and the Women's Fund of the Community Foundation of Southern Wisconsin, and the AAUW, I think we got all of our co-sponsors mentioned. We want to thank you for coming to this very special event where former state senators Tim Cullen and Dale Schultz will be speaking to us about uh, a uh, problem that we're all concerned about, and that's the uh, fair maps for voting in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, as you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has uh, heard a case pertaining to this earlier this month, and uh, we're going to hear more about the issues from Tim and Dale. Before they speak, I want to introduce Ethel Himmel, who has a few words to say. Good evening. I'm Ethel Himmel. I am uh, the Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin and a member of the Janesville League. Um, I just want to give you a brief overview if I figure out how to modulate things here. Brief overview of league involvement in legislative redistricting, whether you call it apportionment, reapportionment, fair maps, it's had a long history um, and lots of different names. The League of Women Voters has advocated for fair voting districts for decades. Since the 1970s, the Wisconsin League, which includes the Janesville League of Women Voters, has supported a redistricting system that does not allow elected officials to draw their own districts, thereby choosing the people who may vote for or against them. It's we, the voters, who should elect our leaders, not the other way around. You'll hear that repeated several times this evening. I might add that the National League of Women Voters has supported prompt reapportionment on the basis of one person, one vote since the early 1930s. One person, one vote means every person's vote has the same weight. The Wisconsin League supports a nonpartisan commission or legislative service agency such as the Legislative Reference Bureau to draw district lines. <clears throat> Initially, we supported an independent commission for redistricting at the state level, but a few years ago, we broadened our position to also support having a nonpartisan legislative agency draw voting districts. We did that in part because it would not take redistricting away from the legislature um, and thus would not require amending the state constitution. We've seen how well it's worked in Iowa to have a legislative agency draw the maps. Through four redistrictings, the Iowa maps have almost always been adopted in their first iteration without litigation. The 2011 Wisconsin redistricting cost taxpayers $2 million in litigation fees, in addition to the cost of having a private law firm draw the maps in the first place. The process was rushed and secretive, and the resulting districts are astoundingly uncompetitive. I won't take you through a detailed account of the numerous lawsuits, court rulings, and legislative actions in which the League has participated. I would like to note, however, that Wisconsin Leagues have had some of their most difficult battles in supporting apportionment of county boards on the basis of population. In 1971 and 1981, several Leagues in Wisconsin had to go to court to force county boards to apportion properly. That said, we do seem to be making progress at this level. Um, at least 30 Wisconsin County Boards have passed the Fair Maps resolutions, which I'm sure you will hear about. Um, in the 1980s, our position lined up with that of the Republicans in the state legislature, and now it lines up with that of the Democrats. The fact is, our position has not changed significantly since the 1970s. All that has changed is which party is in power. Moreover, neither party has been willing to step up and do the right thing when it is in power, sometimes to its own detriment in the following decade. The League believes process is important, in addition to ensuring the principle of one person, one vote, and complying with the Federal Voting Rights Act, the redistricting process must be characterized by objectivity, transparency, accountability, and a strong commitment to fairness. 
citizen participation should be both welcomed and encouraged at every step of the process. Carl, uh, would you bring us up to date with uh, more recent things? Thanks, Ethel. Ethel. Good evening. Um, for the last couple of years, there's been a court case making its way through the justice system related to the Wisconsin map. And it was in the district court for Western Wisconsin, and now it's in the US Supreme Court. And the league has um, filed friends of the court briefs about those cases and asks in explaining the harm that's been done by the 2011 map, asking that the court um, design a different framework that is nonpartisan for redistricting. Uh, in addition to that, the, so the Supreme Court had oral arguments October 3rd, and they're planning on issuing a ruling June of next year about the Wisconsin map. Um, in addition to that, here in Rock County, we have four legislators who have signed on to legislation that's currently making its way through the legislature. That's a, uh, AB 44, Assembly Bill 44, and Senate Bill 13 that have to do with um, changing the process whereby um, Wisconsin redistricts. Uh, those four legislators were um, Senator Janice Ringhand, Representative Deb Colsty, Representative Mark Spreitzer, and Representative Don Bruinick. Um, the other thing that's happened, and this was a year or so ago, the Rock County Board of Supervisors passed a resolution saying that, in fact, um, there should be a nonpartisan way to redistrict. And in fact, last month, it reaffirmed that position in supporting Senate Bill 13 and, and AB 44. So that kind of gives you some background about the league and the league's position over the years, plus what's happening now locally. And I'll turn it over to Sue Conley, who's going to be introducing our speakers. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenters. One a Republican, one a Democrat, but they both believe passionately and agree on this issue. Senator Dale Schultz served as a Republican in the state legislature from 1983 to 2014. First he was in the assembly and then was elected to the Senate in 1990. Senator Tim Cullen served as a Democrat in the Senate from 1974 to 1986. Then he served as Secretary of Health and Social Services from 1987 to 88. He was elected again to the Senate in 2011 and served until 2014. They're both very nice guys. <laughs> and they've been traveling the state, I think uh, almost 50 presentations they've done throughout our state about this issue. The, uh, we're very interested to hear their take on the Supreme Court hearing and their hope for the future, and they are really eager to answer your questions. So they're gonna give us a presentation and then open it up to your questions, and we're gonna ask that you come to the microphone because we are uh, recording this. So if you'll come to the mic, everyone can hear your question, and then they'll give you their answers. So without further ado, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming tonight. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, Dale, Dale always wants me to go first. Um, I don't know why. Um, he, he sort of fixes up what I say wrong, I think is sort of the, the main thing. But uh, first of all, I want to thank all the organizations for supporting this and, and, and co-sponsoring this. It's been uh, terrific. The, the league has been right out in front around the state. Um, ma majority of the invitations we've had are, are initiated by the league. Um, and uh, it, they're, they're in a position now where the league looks like they're tilting Democrat because, they, um, because they're not getting what they want and what the Democrats are for is what they're for. But you have to take a longer view. Uh, there was a time when the Democrats were in charge not that long ago when the league had the same position on all the issues. The Democrats in 09 and 010 didn't listen to them either. So the league hasn't moved. The politics around the place have moved. Um, the first thing I want to do is, is give you a, a pop quiz. We're here, we're in the University of Wisconsin. 
on Rock County campus, what's more appropriate than a pop quiz? Behind me here are, are three maps. Um, the one on the far right is, is the, is the, the uh, Democratic gerrymandered map of Illinois. In the middle is Iowa. In the, oh, the other way around, that's Wisconsin. Well, I, <laughs> now you know why Dale goes second. <laughs> it's Wisconsin over there, Iowa, and, um, and Illinois. And the pop quiz question is, which map was not drawn by the politicians? Yeah. Anybody, anybody have a possible guess on that one? Yeah, you're, I think you all get an A on that. Um, the one with all the right angles, uh, the one in the middle, Iowa, was drawn by the, um, the person who drafts all the rest of the legislation in Iowa, um, as was mentioned by earlier speaker by Eth Ethel. So that, that's sort of our, and, and so we, this begins the point that Dale and I have been trying to make all across the state, and that is that is a gerrymandering it is not a partisan issue. It looks partisan in any given state, depending on who's in power. In Wisconsin, it looks like the Republicans are terrible people um, because they gerrymandered the state, although they did an incredibly unprofessional gerrymander. Uh, but you can go to Illinois. But if you go to Wisconsin, you go to Michigan, you go to North Carolina, you will find very severely gerrymandered um, states by the Republicans. If you go to Maryland, you go to Rhode Island, you go to Massachusetts, you'll find very gerrymandered states done by the Democrats. This issue is all about power. It's about the abuse of power. It's when one party has the governorship and both houses in control. It's the only time a gerrymander can, can occur, or as I think it's more accurate to describe, it's how you rig the elections. Gerrymandering is really rigging the elections by the party in power who can't help themselves. That's, that's what it, it comes down to. And it has so many bad effects across our political system. Uh, when you are in a safe district, and, and only about 10 of the 99 assembly seats in Wisconsin are competitive today. 89 out of the 99, the elections were decided the day the maps were drawn. And that's true if you go to the gerrymandered Democratic states as well. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, if you can't lose in November, then what do you have to worry about? You have to worry about a primary. You have to worry about possibly getting knocked out in a primary. And how does that happen? Usually, and this occurs with, in both parties, even if you're in the minority, uh, because the Democratic seats in Wisconsin are even safer than the Republican seats because they had to stuff the Democrats into a minority number of districts. But they how you how you avoid a primary is you stick with the team all the time you vote with your party you vote with your political base because if you're a republican what you worry about is a primary from the right my right um, they that's what you worry about so how do you avoid that you, you stick with the team you stick with your base all the time if you're a democrat you worry about a primary from the left you stick with the base of the democratic party all the time and what does that mean? That means that you better not get called a few dirty words like uh, a compromiser or a moderate. I mean, my goodness, those, getting called those two words, one of those words can actually get you a primary. I mean, it's that, it, is that, it, gets, it gets that serious. And so that, that's part of why we have the problems with today that we have not only in Washington, but um, in so many state capitals as well. Um, our congressional delegation, which is not part of the lawsuit, which we'll talk about tonight, the congressional delegation, um, their maps are passed by the legislature, but they're drawn um, in Washington by the senior Democrat and the senior Republican. And congressional gerrymandering in Wisconsin is, is incumbent protection gerrymandering. It's not to help one party. It's to make every congressman safe. And they have succeeded at that to a terrific degree. In 2016, there were eight congressional races in Wisconsin. None of them were decided by less than 20 points. All eight of them, the five Republicans, the three Democrats, won by 60, 40, or more. Thanks to the maps in the cases of four of them, and, and thanks to um, just the geography of where people live um, with, with the other four. So it, the, the whole, this whole gerrymandering system makes the system of government not work. So people go around saying, why can't those people in Washington get along? Why can't they compromise? I compromise at my house. How many people have been married more than five days, <laughs> let alone 40 years, um, that haven't, don't know the importance of compromise? That's what we compromise with our friends. We compromise 
in the workplace. It's just the way we lead our lives. And then we see the political system doesn't do that. And you say, why? Well, how the maps are drawn has a whole lot to do with it. You can talk about um, the, the gobs of money that come in from outside groups. It's certainly another factor, but this, th this is a big factor. Um, regarding, Dale probably will say a couple more things about um, the, the, the gerrymandering stuff, but the lawsuit, as was mentioned, was, was the federal case was heard on October 3rd, and it was mentioned that they hope to have a decision by June of next year. I really think and believe, hope that it's going to be sooner than that. I think it's going to be between January and April. And uh, you say, well, is that is that soon enough? If if we were to prevail, and uh, and I think we will. Um, if, if if we if we prevail, um, is there time to, to redraw the maps for the 2018 election? And I believe when when the court if the court rules in our favor, it'll go back to the three judge federal panel that heard the case in the first place um, last last May, year ago May. And um, th that panel said that our maps are unconstitutional. Not that they're bad or they're not fair or they're, they're partisan. Unconstitutional, that's a pretty big word and uh, important word. So I, I find it hard to believe that if, that if the court decides in the early spring of next year that, that this three-judge panel is going to let another election occur under a map that they said was unconstitutional. So I, th I think and it can get done fast, maybe faster than you think. Back in 82, uh, uh, and it was 82, after the 80, cens 80 um, uh, uh, census, uh, we had split government. And that's another thing, just to digress for a second. The reason why I think this issue has caught Wisconsin a little bit off guard in 2011 is if you went back to the, each of the years following the census, all the way back to 1960, so 61, 71, 81, 91, we had divided government every single time. And for the 50 years before 1960, we never reapportioned at all. It was a federal um, case, Baker versus Carr, which was a one person, one vote case, which made Wisconsin and several other states um, reapportioned. So we, it was never a situation going back at least to 1910. And with all the young faces in this room, I don't think any of you were adults in 1910. Um, you wouldn't have any experience in Wisconsin with a gerrymander. And so that, that's why I think a lot of people, when Dale and I started doing this, they said, well, um, that's what those politicians do in Madison. They, they, they draw the maps. Um, and, uh, and they said, well, if the Democrats had been in charge, they'd have done the same thing. And I'd say, yeah, probably. Uh, that's not the point. It doesn't make it right. Um, so we think that the, that the, judge, the, the court will... I mean, first of all, the Supreme Court can say whatever they want about our case, but we've got a standard in the case. And Justice Kennedy, who's a swing vote in this thing, said back in 2003 or 2004 that he thought gerrymandering was bad for democracy, but he said the court needed a standard. He said, you can't come here and cry politics. The court was not interested in that. You have to have a standard. And so our case has a standard. It measures what they call wasted votes, which I don't think it'll take till 7 o'clock to explain that. Um, but it, it, it means how many, by the way you stuff people in the districts, um, how many people's votes really don't matter. They can stay home and the results are going are to occur as, as ever, ever since the map was drawn. They're gonna, so it's, it, it, that, that's sort of the standard. It, it, so it's, it's a mathematical standard. It's not just a, a cry, crying sour grapes standard. The court could adopt that standard if, they were to prevail, if we were to prevail. Um, they could adopt a different standard. But they're likely, in all cases, to send it back to the three-judge panel, um, where, it, where the case went to them from. And um, uh, back in, wait, wait, I started talking about 82. A federal judge drew the maps. When we had divided government, we couldn't agree. So in 81, 91, and 01, if one federal judge drew the maps for Wisconsin, did a good job, nobody complained too much. They didn't have a political agenda. They didn't really want to even do it. They just got assigned the task. Um, but in 82, the federal judge didn't get the maps back to us until June of 82, when there was a September primary then. Now it's, now it's August. Well, we got it done. Um, some people had started to run in one district, and they had to change some of the area that they were running in. Some found out they didn't live in their district anymore um, and had to rent or, or retire. Um, but 
it still happened. So as late as June of 82, we got the map, so we had a September primary on schedule. Now we got August. So a decision January to April, uh, I think this federal court, what, will ha what the three-judge panel will likely do is they will, they will direct the Wisconsin legislature to redraw the maps, and I'll bet they keep them on a very short leash. They may tell them, you've got three weeks or four weeks to redraw the maps, and you've got to, you've got to redraw them to the standard that the Supreme Court approved in the case that was decided, um, Gill versus Whitford. So if they don't draw the maps to meet that standard, um, uh, that there's enough that are, are that so that there are more districts that are competitive uh, than there are today, um, they will likely give it to a single federal judge is what they could do because that's what they've done three different times in the past. So that's kind of the scenario, but, but the United States Supreme Court doesn't have to do what I think, that's for sure. So um, what they decide, and what, they may adopt their own standards. They're taking some time now. They heard it October 3rd. They could have a lot of staff working on this, developing their own standard. We don't know. Uh, but that's um, uh, about where the case is at. And it's, and it's a big deal. Um, if we lose, um, what the Supreme Court will have said, if we lose, is no gerrymandering is too partisanly extreme to be unconstitutional. They're going to say the gates are open. You can you can you can be as partisan, and with computers and technology today, the ability to draw precisely the maps that they can find out through an enormous amount of data exactly who you are and how you're very likely to vote before you even know how you're going to vote. They can find out where you go on vacation, the magazines you read, the car you drive, um, uh, the neighborhood you live in. Um, in, you know any any number of things. What kind of products you you, you like to purchase? Um, all kinds of things about you without having to know. They're not going to know how you voted last time. They're not going to have to know. They're going to know almost for sure how you um, how you are very likely to vote. And when these maps were drawn in 2011 in Wisconsin, they asked the people who drew the maps to to estimate what were going to be the results. This is in in the, in the early summer of 11. They asked them when the maps were done and passed, in these districts, what do you think the percentage results will be 15 months later in November of 2012? And in several of those districts, the people who drew the maps predicted the results within a percent. If they said someone was going to win 58-42, they won 58.2. Uh, they, 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 knew, they, they knew what they'd done, and they did it very, very well. If you like gerrymandering, we have a beautiful gerrymandered uh, map. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, but that's sort of the time frame. Uh, it's the first time the Supreme Court's ever taken a, a case involving a political gerrymander. They'll take a lot of cases involving racial gerrymandering. First time ever, so it's a pretty exciting thing for, for a lot of people. Um, certainly it is for, for Dale and myself. So I'll stop there, and I, and I, I also, Dale's making me do this step, not me. Deb did not want to be introduced, but when a state legislator cares enough to come here, I think she deserves it. State Representative Deb Colsty is here. Deb. Go ahead. And this is my friend, by the way. <laughs> we, we, when we go around the state to all these things, we, we always figure out the first, he's coming from Richland Center, and I'm in Janesville. We figure out work, and we meet to drive together the rest of the way. Um, we were in Stevens Point last night. We've been as far north as Rhinelander and everywhere else in between. So, uh, and we, we like each other enough to ride along in the car, <laughs> or, or, tr or truck in his case. We, we've been friends indeed uh, over 30 years. I, I'd also like to uh, uh, say kudos to uh, the League of Women Voters and all the organizations that sponsored this. Uh, this is a great crowd. And to each and every one of you, you're to be commended for your citizenship and your willingness to give up a beautiful fall evening <laughs> uh, to be here in, in this campus. Uh, no, it really is impressive. I know in, in our busy lives, uh, it's difficult to find times to be the citizens we all want to be. And you certainly have made it a priority. And, and for Tim and I, uh, who it started on this quest uh, a few years ago. It, it's really 
heartwarming to see that because when we started out the rooms weren't anywhere near this full and our critics said well nobody cares about that it's it's not important in fact a lot of people didn't care about it but uh, things have certainly changed let me uh, just say that when I get up in the morning I don't know what you do but I typically get a cup of coffee and either read the paper or you know, quite often I'll turn the television on and check out the news and then after about a half hour of that torture I kind of wander out of the den and wonder whether I, you know I, I'm still alive or I'm in an alternate reality or something because it's a torturous experience anybody share that with me <laughs> the rest of you I assume don't even bother watch anymore and, and you know it's sad because um, uh, you know the, the fact that we can get information about our government the fact that we can discuss our government is part of who we are and what makes our system of government special and uh, Tim and I sat in the uh, Senate chamber at sort of the early days of Act 10 and uh, saw our world spinning apart, the governance and the legislature collapsing, people getting angrier and angrier, and really made a commitment to each other that, that we needed to make a difference, that we needed to do something uh, to help us get out of where we were. and. Uh, you know, at the time we were rated the most polarized state in the nation and it was really difficult to govern and I don't know that we've ever really completely recovered from that and uh, and that makes us sad so we decided right then and there we would uh, try to set an example because we thought that was the most powerful thing we could do and, and use our friendship and our, our willingness to uh, discuss issues and, and listen to each other uh, to show people that the world didn't have to be the way it was unfolding for us at that time. And uh, that was true for the issues in the legislature, whether it was mining or, or uh, school funding or redistricting. And, and we have uh, really enjoyed uh, getting to know people, uh, getting to know members of the league who've taken the leadership role on this uh, issue. and. Uh, and it's really great to see the, that now what people said wasn't important to people is suddenly more important uh, than, than folks realized. I don't know how many of you listen to public radio. I'm kind of a public radio junkie and they have some new shows on because we've had some retirements here in Wisconsin. Some great people have retired. But there's a new program called 1A uh, moderated by Josh Johnson. I think he does a terrific job. And I heard a week ago uh, he mentioned that one of the or the most requested topic for his national syndicated uh, program was redistricting and gerrymandering and I heard him say it again today and uh, you know it makes me feel great because our challenge with redistricting has been that you know what it just isn't visceral I mean who really cares about those people in Madison you know I had a late dearly departed uh, brother who never voted and you know and here he had a younger brother who's interested in politics and he used to tell me regularly I never vote it just encourages the bastards <laughs> uh, and I think sometimes a lot of us feel that way uh, just because the political process deserves that but you know we do hope that government seriously will serve our interests and that people will actually represent us and if you're looking for things that are wrong I, I think you don't really have to look too much further than uh, what redistricting has done and what uh, the influence of money in the process has done with the uh, 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 Supreme Court decisions that have opened the floodgates, Citizens United, the, and, the, and then the McCutcheon decision. And uh, we've just decided that we're going to focus on one thing and see it through and, and make a difference because I think if we can team up with some people and show folks that you know there's still room for a real democracy uh, it might be catching and and somebody else will step up and take the leadership for money and politics and and certainly will be there to help but that's our hope and uh, uh, Tim alluded to the Supreme Court decision 
that's forthcoming. I'd like to believe uh, in our Supreme Court that it's above politics. I think we all want to believe that those judges aren't partisan, and yet part of what we know is that's not completely true. But they get a lifetime appointment, so they could do the right thing and don't have to worry about uh, recrimination. And I'd like to think that we could have more than a 5-4 decision and put a resounding stamp back on fairness um, in the great debate that occurs in this country uh, rather than, than the um, movement of political uh, levers. I, uh, I, I want to tell you right up front because it's important to just admit it. I voted for this plan in Wisconsin. I don't view this as partisan, as Tim said. You, don't, you only have to look south here to Illinois to see that this is not a, a, a Republican problem. It just happens in this state. Uh, some of my colleagues um, maybe push the envelope further than they should. And I'm not naive about, never have been naive about redistricting. Um, 50 years ago, or over 50 years ago, when I was a lad, had more hair and was a lot skinnier. I remember one time going into my mother's uh, law office in the conference room and seeing four maps for the state of Wisconsin that showed, you know, the different possibilities for redistricting the state. So I've, I've been around it for a long time, and I think most politicians, you know, really hope that they'll get the chance to slightly adjust the elections in their favor. At least that's always sort of been the talk. And the epiphany for me occurred after the election. Um, because quite frankly, I didn't pay that much attention to it uh, because we sort of assigned the responsibility to the leader. We've both been leaders of our party. And uh, being a good uh, leader means that when it's your turn to follow, you, you've got to be a good follower too. So you trust the leader to do their job. And uh, uh, we were told that we need to hire some attorneys to stay out of court, make sure that we did the job right. And uh, that certainly made sense to me. And uh, I was given the courtesy of seeing my district uh, after signing a statement of notice of non-disclosure. Um, and my district really didn't change much, so I didn't really pay that much attention to it. There are other larger fish to fry at that time. Well, the election occurred, and you know I, we got blown out. It was a Democrat wave year. There, there was 137,000 more votes cast in Wisconsin for Democrats than Republicans, and then somebody said, but the good news is we won 60 seats in the assembly. And I said, what? That, I mean, that, does, that, that doesn't make sense. Some, there's something wrong here. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, it, it caused me to think and to do some investigation. And I came to the realization that this wasn't uh, my father's redistricting or my mother's redistricting. This was an entirely new animal. What changed? Um, computer power, uh, the programming that went into redistricting programs, and the whole science of analytics that uh, Tim talked about. Not only could we send people door to door to find out how folks are going to vote or call them on the phone and poll them, uh, we suddenly had available unbelievable amounts of information about everybody in our society, every website you've ever been to every purchase you've made online. All that information is collected and sold. I think many of you know that. And it, it goes into a profile that, that says more about us than maybe we're, we, or at least more than we should be comfortable about. So yeah, there are people there who can pretty much say after you know putting the direct uh, effort together with the analytics, they know with a startling predictability what the outcome of elections will be, and the essence of drawing the lines determines the election. And, uh, and when you can uh, pack and crack at will, that's the process of putting people into district to uh, diminish the value of votes or, or, or peel them away, um, you have uh, a very powerful tool, and that's exactly what happened. Now I got to tell you, um, you can maybe guess by how I'm dressed here tonight. I, I don't golf a lot. Tim has golfed with me. I don't golf well at all. Um, I'm a guy more uh, comfortable on the farm um, than, than maybe in a, a downtown. And my dad told me a long time ago, Dale, when you're in the pasture and you step in it, don't sit there and explain and make excuses what happened. Just step out of it. Now. <laughs> 
I know from watching television those mornings now that it's not popular for anybody to ever admit they made a mistake. They double down and double down and double down and get blue in the face. And of course, that's how every argument ends. Well, I'd like to think that when I make a mistake, uh, I, there'd be an opportunity for redemption if I was honest about it, told people right up front. And uh, you deserve to know that, um, from, for those of you who didn't know that I had voted for the plan. And I wanted to uh, make mention of that. But um, uh, we have come a long way, and, um, and we're here tonight to not only to answer your questions, but to give you a charge. You know, um, we'd like to think that single-handedly we could win this case. Um, we've worked hard, but we know that's just a little bit narcissistic that the fact of the matter is uh, a lot of people have stood up and, and raised their voices. 57 uh, Wisconsin counties have uh, stood up, not normally partisan at all, and said it's time to do this. Last night in Stevens Point, we had uh, a woman get up and said, well, counties, my township passed a resolution. Yeah, a lot of local units of government have passed resolutions. And, and the woman said, well, what can we do? What can we do to affect this? And we said, well, I'll tell you what we're doing. We're not writing editorials to local newspapers. Uh, we're writing them and sending them to the East Coast. And the reason we're doing that is we know that those uh, law clerks and those Supreme Court justices are not reading the State Journal uh, or the Janesville Gazette. They're reading the Washington Post or the New York Times. So trying to be efficient and, and direct about it, we're trying very hard to um, make a splash in East Coast media. Um, we know that uh, this material does get absorbed. And if you want to do something, write a letter to the editor. And, and I know the, the paper here publishes them, like most newspapers. Write one uh, to the New York Times. Send a letter uh, to those Supreme Court justices. Shoot them an email. We need to show them that ordinary people in Wisconsin, men and women of goodwill of both political parties, recognize there's something wrong in our body politic, and we want to see it changed. And what, regardless of whether we're a Republican or a Democrat, we know that we need to have a process that treats us both fairly so that we can have faith in our institutions. And, and tell them this, your, your story of, 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 of is this importance and what people are doing. Because I think if we do that and we do it uh, collectively, they will hear us there. And uh, they can't help, I believe, uh, from doing uh, what we all know in our hearts is, is the right thing. And uh, I guess uh, I'm going to end there because we really want to get to the questions. But we have a little tradition, Tim and I, as we've gone around the state. Uh, at this point in the program, I always say it's time for the shameless shill. And I said, many of you probably don't know that. Uh, Tim Cullen has written a book. I suspect a few uh, of you in uh, uh, Janesville know that. And, uh, and, uh, and it's a good book. And I was privileged to have the opportunity to read it for content, or read several chapters with content uh, 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 for my good friend. And so I, I feel like I have a little ownership. But what is really special, as you know, None of this money goes to Tim. In fact, he financed the thing, um, um, took a risk, and all of the money, all of it, uh, goes to uh, a very special scholarship fund that you all have generously supported in this community and I think is a real inspiration for the state. And I have it on, uh, on, uh, on his word, Tim's word, that if, if you buy one of these books tonight, he will uh, autograph it, and in case you brought your own, he'll autograph it as well. And it, it's, it's been a huge hit around the state, so I, Tim, I hope you'll forgive me, but I, I wanted to get that in here for your hometown crowd. You're so completely, You're completely forgiven. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. We'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. If you'd rather just get up and vent, that's okay. I'm sure you'll feel better and we might learn something as well. But uh, we're just delighted to be here and we'll hang around for a little while uh, afterwards to uh, meet and, and greet you all. I wondered um, how many of you realize that uh, redistricting 
actually begins close to home. Here in Rock County, uh, the county uh, districts, the county, the county board, and uh, I happened to be there one night when uh, they were redistricting, and uh, they draw, drew the line on a district right down the middle of the main street of Clinton. Now, you know, come on. Clinton is a nice place to live, but it's not that big uh, that you have to, you know, break it up. <coughs> and they were breaking it up. And the League of Women Voters in Janesville uh, said, hey, that doesn't work. And we took them to court and won. Uh, John Shabazz, Shabazz. Shabazz was the federal judge who heard the case. And when I thought of John, I thought, Ooh, there we go. But he uh, not only decided in favor of the League of Women Voters of Janesville, actually Rock County, because Beloit joined us. Uh, and, uh, but he had the attorney for the, for the county stand up in court and he read him up one side and down the other and he said, and you should take that back to the county board, please. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I guess what I would like people to understand is that you've got to keep your eye on the ball or there it's going to happen. It's going to happen here, it's going to happen anywhere, unless people make themselves heard. Thank you. Well, and also it's probably worth pointing out that the three-judge federal panel that heard, heard this case sat in Madison a year ago, May, um, the, the, the head, the lead judge of the three judge panel was appointed by President Reagan, and he's the one that wrote the decision. Um, and he said, he's the one that used the word unconstitutional. So in, in our incredibly partisan world we live in, um, as Dale pointed out, and some people would think this is a problem, but one of, the, one of the strengths of our system may well be the lifetime appointment of federal judges. Two of, the, two of the three were appointed. He was appointed by Reagan, and um, the other the second one was appointed by President George W. Bush, and the third by President Clinton. And the decision uh, was two to three. And so it shows you that, that partisanship doesn't have to prevail, and that uh, these judges uh, do have the capacity to step away from partisanship. You know, it, it just amazes me how many people have talked about or talked uh, to people about fake news. You ever hear that term? <laughs> How about rigged? You know, everything is rigged. You know, I don't ever in my life remember hearing this, and I, I couldn't have even fathomed it, but now it's a normal part of, part of our lives. And, and I think we've gotten to a point in our society where we really need to do some self-examination, every one of us. And, you know, I've been involved in politics for 50 years. And I've been to Janesville before to talk to my friend George Stiles to help, you know, organize for the Republican Party. Uh, and I'm still proud to be a member of the party of Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt and Ike Eisenhower and Ronald Reagan. And sometimes I wonder, like Jeff Flake, about some people in my own party. It looks like a hostile takeover from the John Birch Society to me. But, you know, sometimes I think we have to find it in ourselves to rise above our partisan leanings and be patriots and to recognize that the system of government that was bequeathed us is special and valuable. And you know, we can lose this democracy as sages have pointed out and it's up to us uh, to work hard and keep our eye on the ball to keep it. Question? Yes. Well, first a comment, but I invite your comment on it. Uh, I've grew up in Wisconsin 
and was always proud to say where I was from when I lived in all these different places. And sometimes I felt like the only liberal <clears throat> in my conservative suburb. And sometimes on the West Coast, I felt like the, <laughs> the most conservative person in the whole world. And in all cases, though, if you feel you're going to the polls and it makes no difference at all because the district, whatever the district may be, is uncompetitive, it's disheartening and it keeps people away from the polls after a few futile attempts. So I was wondering if you could talk to younger people about that. Well, I think, uh, I first of all have a whole lot more faith in the often called the millennials, and a lot of people do. Um, people would say, well, there aren't very many millennials here tonight. Uh, well, that's, that's probably true, although I see a few. Um, but uh, they communicate and they care in different ways than, than my generation does. Um, my daughter, I don't think, has ever held a newspaper in her hand in her whole life, uh, but she reads the New York Times every day. She, they do everything online. They, they, they join online, they talk online, they, they organize online. Uh, they don't go to meetings, they don't join the, the, the Moose Club or, or probably the League of Women Voters. Um, they were talking about that in Stevens Point last night, that they're trying to get more young people to join. Uh, but they care. Uh, they care a lot about the issues and they um, um, are going to make a big difference. Uh, they don't go to church as much as older generations. They don't particularly care about unions. Um, they figure, put us in charge of the company and we'll treat people fairly. That's how they look at things. And so I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future. And, and they have this vehicle, which can be abused, the computer, but, but they, have the, they have the ability to, to organize and, and act collectively um, without going out to a meeting. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, but it, it, is, it is discouraging to um, uh, know that your vote is probably not going to matter. Um, thank goodness it still matters in presidential U.S. Senate, gubernatorial, all the statewide races, it still matters entirely. You can't gerrymander a statewide race, fortunately. But um, uh, there, there's hope. I, um, I always remember this great quote from Benjamin Franklin. He came out of the Constitutional Hall in 1787. He ran into a woman on the street in Philadelphia, and she knew who he was and where he'd been. And um, she said to him, um, Mr. Franklin, did we get our republic? Which, of course, we have a republic. People don't often think about that. Did we get our republic? And um, uh, Franklin said to her, yes, and now we'll see if you can keep it. And I think that's still the question, that, that, it's a question that's out there today. Are, are we going to, Dale mentioned that, you know, how, how fragile democracy is. Um, it, we, we just, it's something we just think, well, it's going to be okay, it's going to be all right. But it's, it's always been fragile, and, and many different generations, there, there, have been, there have been people who have, who have challenged our system of government, and, um, and the more difficult the times, the more unsettling the times, the further they get in stirring up um, the public. And we're, we're going through a terribly um, huge change in, in our economy. Uh, people in Janesville who remember General Motors plant know it as well as lots of other places, uh, that, the, um, that, the, that the person who works on the line in a manufacturing company making something, in almost every case going forward, is going to be replaceable by a robot. It's a brutal, cold, hard truth that is very difficult to accept, but it's there, but we'll move on. It's, um, you know, there's, we used to have blacksmiths that fixed the horseshoes, too, so uh, we, we, we find ways to, to move on, but it's, it's when things are fragile and people are unsure about their future um, that um, um, uh, there's always a demagogue to show up uh, to try to tell them that they've got all the answers. And I don't just mean a particular person in this country. I mean a lot of people um, in this country. I want to just respond to what you had to say. I, I, I think we, we share each other's pain. Uh, believe it or not, at one time I was considered, and Tim will verify this, if not the most, one of the most conservative people in the Wisconsin legislature. And in recent years, I've never moved so far to the left just trying to hold my own ground. 
uh, the, the entire world shifted out from underneath me. And, uh, you know, again, it goes back to that, that day in the state senate when Tim and I looked at each other and said, you know, what can we do? Because this, this can't last in our society. And we have an obligation, given the special privileges that we've been given, um, to do something, to make a difference. But, um, you know, we live in, a, in an interesting time, and it reminds me of that ancient Chinese curse, and we'll just have to make the best of it. Got some questions? Yes. Um, you mentioned the um, packing and cracking of districts. But what you failed to mention or, or lightly went over was the demographics of where people live today. Um, Democrats basically live in large municipalities. And there has been a, a, a great shift over the years in where people live. And I think that has a, as big, if not a bigger, impact on our elections than gerrymandering does. For instance, um, in the last presidential election in Wisconsin, Donald Trump won 59 counties. Ron Johnson won 54 counties. 75% of the counties he won. Donald Trump won 82% of the counties in Wisconsin. And that's reflective of where people live. And, and so I, I guess I'd like you to address that aspect of it. And along with that, I think if you were to try to draw districts so that they're all 52, 48 or less, you would have such screwed up looking districts that nobody would recognize them. Well, um, last night I was challenged to give the arguments for the folks that uh, were on the other side of the lawsuit and I, I think I did a reasonably good job listening to you, patting myself on the back. I think you make the arguments very well. And I think there's a lot of truth to what you say. People do have a huge impact um, based on where they live. But the premise of this lawsuit has to do with the value of a vote and everybody's vote being equal and meaning the same amount. And that goes to motivation as lines are drawn. Now, I, Tim and I are not here to tell you that, that this lawsuit is going to result in 99 assembly districts that'll all be competitive. Of course not, that's silly. For all the reasons that you've uh, said. But when we see, and the Supreme Court has said that it believes partisan gerrymandering is wrong, it's also said that it believes in the concept of symmetry. That in fact, if uh, we have a state where one political party, as we saw, the Democrats wins with 137,000 votes, that it's likely that the legislature should somewhat reflect that. And here all of a sudden we have Republicans picking up 60 seats. Now, I've been a leader before. The first thing I'm going to stand up and say is, well, it's all due to the job I did recruiting candidates and raising money and messaging. Um, and, you know, that political spin is familiar to most of us. But I think that what I saw in that and had to face uh, was something that uh, I hadn't ever seen before, and I saw the power of tools and what uh, people uh, could do with those tools if we didn't have a transparent process. And I was keenly aware of how that would be reacted to by the general public. The public believes things are faked and rigged because they have every right to believe that because, in fact, we've been turning our head and we've tried to turn it again and they got us. And it seems to me that we all have an opportunity to link arms on a, on a bipartisan basis and say, you know what, every vote should have meaning again. And the whole premise of this lawsuit, I'm not an attorney, so forgive me if, I, if I'm less than eloquent or don't get the law right uh, exactly, but it's that uh, people's votes ought not be diminished by being put, uh, being wasted as the lawsuit uh, talks about wasted votes for where there we have some districts made way more partisan than they need to be in order to move uh, votes away from it to make another vote, uh, another district more competitive. That's really what we're talking about. 
we know that the districts uh, are going to have to represent communities of interest. We know that the districts are going to have to uh, reflect the voting uh, rights law uh, that we have in this country as well they should. And that means that not every race will be competitive. But for heaven's sakes, do we really think, uh, are, are we really satisfied with what's happened to our federal elections? What do we got, 25 seats that are, are competitive? You get elected to Congress, you never lose. And we're now on the road to doing that in the state legislature. Where do you know in Janesville that you can get a job guarantees you employment for 10 years by making one decision. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. People who stick to the party who have decided to be good partisans rather than good patriots. John, my, uh, John, I, I, I sure, but go, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, if the lines were drawn, what you guys would call more competitive, how many competitive seats do you think would be in that's exactly what I was going to address. None of us are saying that, you're, like Dale said, it's going to be a, everybody's going to have a competitive seat. Um, right now, it'd be pretty hard to make a competitive race, even in Janesville or even in Beloit. Certainly not in Madison. Certainly not in Milwaukee. But just as those are pretty solid the Democratic areas. But if you take the counties around Milwaukee, Waukesha, Ozaki, Washington County, um, you couldn't create a competitive race in those counties. The current map has about 10 competitive seats. You can probably, without doing sort of um, um, equity gerrymandering, in other words, creating what you call, you know, you'd, you'd have crazy looking lines to try to create a competitive district. But without doing that, you could probably have 20 to 25 competitive seats in Wisconsin. Um, and that, that's, that's really what's likely to happen, the idea that everybody's going to but the whole thing about gerrymandering is intent. What was their intent when they drew the lines? Um, was it to, they made sure they passed one person, one vote test, every, every district has the same number of people. But their intent was to draw the lines that ensured their majority for 10 years. You could have an intent to draw the lines to create competitive districts to see what happens. But that wasn't the intent here. And you need to look no further. I was debating whether they're bring this topic up or not, but I'm going to. There's a district in, which is the Beloit area called the 45th Assembly seat. It was one, it's a district that included all, in 2010, included all of Beloit and includes southeastern Rock County. So it's the whole Clinton area out where John lives. And it was a, it was a district that leaned Democratic. It had mostly been represented by Democrats, but a couple of Republicans had won the seat. The Republican won the seat um, in 2010, even though lean Democrat, because for logical reasons, the top of the ticket in the state went Republican in 2010. Now, there's a problem. That person won the seat in a, a competitive district that tilted Democrat, went to Madison and voted for Act 10 and for all the issues, all the issues that her party, all the big issues that her party wanted, she voted for them, every one of them. The odds are extremely high that had she had to run for re-election in 2012 in the election in the seat in the district that she won in in 2010, she, she may have eked it out, but she likely could have got beat. What did they do when they drew the map? They drew her out of 90% of Beloit, left only the far eastern part of Beloit, kept southeastern Rock County in the district, which is the most Republican part of Rock County, is southeastern Rock County. But they had drawn out about 30,000 people, literally half of an assembly seat, by taking that legislator out of Beloit. So they ran the district over into Walworth County, didn't even want to risk Delavan, which is getting kind of democratic now. So they ran around Delavan to bottom of Del and, and to get Elkhorn and Fontana and the whole area around Lake Geneva, Sharon, and all that area, created a district that had been top of the ticket 52, 53% Democratic to a, t to a seat that was 60%, 40% Republican. Now that was a gerrymander. That was a, that was a gerrymander with the intent to create a safe seat, which was otherwise would have been a competitive seat. And the person who represents that district, I happen to think is a nice person. I get along with her very well. When I have a high school internship program, she has an intern 
every summer in her office. But that, and then, and then the other consequence of that was then that left 90% of Beloit, and they created an absolutely airtight, wired Democratic seat, which was Beloit up the, the west side of Rock County, up to and including Evansville, which is now a very Democratic city. It wasn't 40 years ago. It's a 60-40 Democratic city. What happened in both those districts? Since 2012, um, both of them have had an election when there wasn't even an opponent. It wasn't worth putting somebody up to get clobbered. Um, that, that, that gerrymander, so, so the point I want to make, the bigger point is that, is that everything you said about the areas of the state is true. The gerrymandering occurs in and around larger cities, right, where there's some city areas and there's some suburban areas. That's where the gerrymandering occurs. It, do, it doesn't occur in, in a lot of Wisconsin, but it does, it does, when you get out in the suburban Madison, you get, you, you get, you get suburban Green Bay, you get suburban, look, La Crosse is hardcore Democrat. They left that a hardcore Democratic seat, but the rest of La Crosse County, they made sure uh, a Republican could win, um, for sure, by not having any part of the city be out into the county of La Crosse. So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing with the premise that people tend to, to vote or live sort of with people that, that vote the way they do. It occurs a lot. But if your intent is to gerrymander, you can still get it done, even with the large number of people who live in cities tending to vote Democrat, rural areas tend to vote Republican. But you could do it, and they did it with this map, and that was their intention. Um, the intent was to create a, a, a map that for, over which would have to be, there would have to be a 60-40 top of the ticket um, landslide for the Democrats to possibly have them have a chance, have a chance at winning the assembly after they do the map. Let's stipulate if the Democrats were in charge, they likely do the same thing, Tim, as I've heard him say it a hundred times. But because one party does it, the other party ought to do it, and that makes it right. When you take your kids to a, 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 a sporting event, do you tell them, go ahead and cheat because the other side cheats? No, we don't operate like that. And when we treat each other like that in government, we shouldn't be surprised when people get fighting mad. And it's gotten to the point where it's time for adults to stand up, blow the whistle, ask for a timeout, and change things. And that's what I hope the Supreme Court will do. I'm here to tell you, neither one of us are very popular under the marble dome. But I'll tell you what, I'd trade that in a second for the support that we've gotten around the state where this is a very popular issue. And I'd offer you know, the, the resolutions by the counties and the municipalities and the organizations because they see the problem too. You know, we have an opportunity in this country to restart the clock, and both political parties uh, can do that, and I hope they will. And, and to put some balance back into a system that has worked pretty well. It's not been perfect, but it, it's worked uh, pretty well. Yes? Okay. 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 And more yeah. or less, Oh, I, it, the Iowa system can work anywhere because I, it goes back to intent. The intent there is that the person who draws the maps can't even consider the political makeup of, of the areas or the, or the hometown of the incumbent. Uh, that guy in Iowa has been drawing incumbents out of their districts. And in 40 years, no legislator of either party in Iowa, no Republican, no Democrat, has ever introduced one piece of a bill to change that Iowa system. People in both parties love it, and um, I think they'll love it here. Someone once said that Wisconsin is that Iowa is just Wisconsin without Milwaukee. So we're we're, um, we're, we're I didn't say that. Some other, Somebody said a, ma a mayor a mayor of Milwaukee said that actually. <laughs> yeah, the microphone. Yeah. Um, first again, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for coming out this evening. Uh, as you complimented us for getting involved, I'm sure you have other things you could do with your evenings than come to the people of the state. And again, I want to thank you for getting involved on our behalf. Um, I'd like to see. Of course, I'd like to see some incumbents come and take these seats as well and open up uh, to question and answer as well, but that's another story perhaps for another time. Actually, what I wanted to ask you is a two-part question, both of parts of which fall into the category of what next, uh, broadly. 
uh, for the sake of discussion, for the first part, the bigger picture, let's presume for the sake of discussion uh, that the politicians themselves will not act out of their own self-interest and redo this willingly. And secondly, that the Supreme Court, if it votes against us, um, then that's that to some extent. Um, as you see it, is there a master plan going forward for what to do uh, if the Supreme Court turns it down and the politicians don't act out of their own self-interest? Uh, what next? As I say, at that point, that we go on and have a plan in place to deal with it that the interests of the vast majority of people are represented more than just a relatively small handful at that point. Well, well there's two solutions, really. One, one, one is, that, um, is that we go to the Iowa system and just take it out of the hands of the, of the elected officials. Now, those who oppose what we're trying to do will say, well, the Constitution says the legislature must pass the reapportionment map. That is true. That's, the Constitution says they must pass it. The Constitution doesn't say they must draw it. And that's a big distinction. In Iowa, the legislature passes the reapportionment map just like they do everywhere else, but they don't get to draw it. This guy draws it, they can vote it up or down, but they can't change it. Um, and that's, that's how, they've, how they've made it work. So that, that, that's one way. The other way is that you really, something you really can't orchestrate, which is divided government. Um, if, you have, um, if you don't have the governorship in both houses all in the control of one party, you will not have gerrymandering. What party would be foolish enough to let the other party gerrymander the state? So um, divided government, which is what we had from 1960 through 2000, um, was what prevented this from happening in the last 50 years. And so that's not something we can sit here and orchestrate happening. But, um, but the Iowa system, um, I, I think, um, uh, is, is the ultimate best answer. Even if we won in the court and we, we, we somehow got these maps redrawn to be more competitive, the long-term answer still is Iowa, to, to do the Iowa system. So there are two ways. Let, let, let me just say that, that um, um, as I've mentioned before, neither Tim or I are attorneys. We're, we're, as they say, we're not even allowed to play one on TV. We uh, are, are not plaintiffs in the lawsuit, so we can't tell you any great scheme that's going to occur or what the strategy is because we don't sit in those meetings. What we were asked to do uh, was to head up this fair voting initiative uh, around gerrymandering and go out and build support and to educate people. and. Um, and that's what we've tried to do. And we can sort of give you what we think might happen, but that doesn't mean we, we actually know. And I want you to understand that. So um, buyer beware here. Well, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, on a more individual level, the second part of my question is this. Um, from your experience, not just as legislators, but doing these forums and encountering a lot of people over time, how do you see us motivating other people to get involved, mindful that as good as we feel about it in this room, there are a whole lot more people who aren't here tonight in the community doing other things, and if we talk to them, usually they'll tell us, and understandably so, that on any given day, perhaps more important to them is what the Packers are doing or uh, how busy their schedule is already with too much to do and not enough time for new initiatives or just that general sense of despair people are feeling that their vote doesn't matter, their voice isn't heard, uh, that the politicians won't listen, the judges are biased, and generally they're lost in the system. How would you recommend not just approaching it from your point of view, but from ours of reaching out and getting more people involved and interested in the process? Well, you know, I, I think all of us sort of feel a little bewildered. Um, you know, it seems like every day there's some new hot issue, and you, you got to hand it to President Trump. He's pretty good at running a, a, a reality show, and he's turned the presidency into that. And my guess is um, there are a lot of people who are happy with that because he's continually polls about 30 percent, and people like that. Um, but it, it's distracting, and and it's hard to get people to focus on things when they're so busy in their lives, you know, trying to provide for their family or, or get their degree and start a family or what they're going to worry about their job. And, and you know, let's face it, you know, this is kind of esoteric, you know, it, it's not really visceral. What our challenge is, is to connect this process um, to the things that are important to them and explain how they're joined at the hip. 
Um, now, I gave you a specific assignment, you know, let's work on those East Coast newspaper, but let's not lose sight of the fact that in Wisconsin that we have a, a big educational effort. And let's go about that business um, and, and make this less partisan, more about good government. You know, I think everywhere Tim and I have gone, we've tried to be courteous and respectful of Republicans or Democrats who showed up to be a part of the discussion. Uh, obviously, this lawsuit this was started here in Wisconsin, and it puts my Republican Party uh, on the defensive. But the fact is, we have the problem right across the border to the south. Uh, we see it in both political parties across this country, and it's hurting all of us. And I think that if, when we approach our friends and our neighbors like that, we can have a much better discussion rather than what we see so often where the church gets divided or golf foursomes break up over our inability to discuss important issues. But that means in our heart that we have to come to the table recognizing that other people um, have concerns and, and, and that, that we are trying to reach a consensus about what's the best way forward for all of us. And most, most great movements in this country didn't start with, with 100,000 people behind it. I mean, uh, legal women voters, but um, uh, there were a, a pretty small number of women that met in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 and thought it was a good idea that women ought to be able to vote. How long did that take? 72 years. Uh, and uh, so, so they, they, they could have said, well, you know, how are we going to change this? How are we going to get a bunch of men to vote? To, to let us vote, uh, and that 72 years later they succeeded. So it, it, most most causes, even in, in local causes, whether it's something that you want the city council to do or the town board or whatever, and sometimes it's one person, two people that um, that started. And so um, I really think this letter idea may may um, seem kind of crazy to you, but um, the New York Times likes to sell papers all over the country. They don't like just selling them in New York, and so. Uh, getting a letter from somebody in Janesville, Wisconsin, um, could be a very much of interest to them. Uh, or, or if they happen to get five letters from Janesville, Wisconsin, um, that, that said the same thing in different ways, um, they might just print it. And I, I know for an absolute fact, I've been assured by someone who his job is to work with the Supreme Court, that, that at least Justice Kennedy, if not others, every morning, their office gets the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. So um, you can write a letter to the Wall Street Journal too. Uh, but um, it, that's, the only, that's the most concrete thing I think you can do now in terms of trying to influence this court. Because I think justices, they always talk about their, um, how their behavior and how they can rise above politics and so on. They also care about their legacy. Um, and whether they say that or not, I believe they do. It's what a lot of people, will, most of us, in some which way or another, we sort of care about um, whether our time on this earth has been worth it or not, and I, I think they do too. And so they, um, they they can be influenced. I think one of the big things we've been helped by is not so much national Republican figures who are in office, although Governor John Kasich from Ohio was willing to step out there, but some extremely prominent Republicans, um, and also Senator John McCain, but. Um, uh, Bob Dole, who was the Republican nominee in 1996, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the former governor of, of, of California. Uh, the, the, these folks, um, sometimes you see people who are, are no longer in office in a political party. Sometimes you can find out that's where the truth is because now they're off the hook. They don't have to raise any money and they don't have to, um, oh, I couldn't use that phrase, could I? Begins with the word kiss, but I'll, um, we won't use that one. But um, you, you get freed up, and a, and a guy like Bob Dole and a guy like John McCain is 80, and he, he just won a six-year term. He's, he has cancer. He's likely not to be planning on running for re-election in, in, in 20, what would it be, 2022, I guess. Uh, so um, I think it's worth listening to um, people like that. Schwarzenegger's played a big role in this thing. Um, uh, and uh, so there's... There's, there's people of good faith around the country, I think, that because, they, because I, I started at the very beginning, you have to look past which party did it to you in which state and look at the whole country and see that every party with all the power, does, both parties with all the power do it. It just looks partisan towards what for or against a party in a particular state, but that's, 
it's the problem's bigger than any one state. And, and in Wisconsin, Bill Krause, Dave Martin. Bill Krause was the right hand of the Governor Lee Dreyfus. Uh, Dave Martin uh, ran for Lieutenant Governor from the Fox River Valley, uh, former Senator Dan Tino, myself. There are Republicans who have stood up and said, enough is enough, we need to change this. Um, and, and we tried to do it in a, in a way that uh, kept the door open for everyone. You know, if we keep growing this movement um, and we start a parade, I guarantee you every politician in this state will fight to get in front of it. But we've got to provide the momentum. And we've got to show them that it isn't going to disappear. Because if we are not successful in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the Supreme Court, Katie bar the door because you will see in the next election an unbelievable amount of money, the best technology and an analytics brought to bear, then your vote won't mean anything at all. It will all be ordained uh, behind closed doors. That doesn't benefit anybody. I've always enjoyed politics because I enjoyed a good argument. The, the, the opportunity to, to uh, challenge others with my ideas and to be challenged by their ideas, and hopefully, um, in, in a thoughtful discussion with an open mind, we'd find the best solution. And uh, if we don't do that, um, you're going to be getting up with me in the morning watching TV, wondering if you're in reality or someplace else. So I guess it's overall kind of depressing because what you're basically saying, if the Supreme Court doesn't intervene, the governor election is all that matters because we know the assembly and the Senate are preordained already. So if the governor doesn't turn Democrat to force divided governance, it's pretty much 10 more years lost. Well, in, in, in Iowa, uh, once the public got used to this and figured it out, um, no politician had the courage uh, to change it or they bought into the idea, it doesn't really matter, it's worked. Look, you're talking to a couple of guys who've made their life's work uh, looking for that pony in, in a stall full of horseshit. Um, it is depressing sometimes. But I know there are people in this room who fought for causes and hung in there when it looked hopeless. It just makes the victory sweeter. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It, it, you know, it's up to us what our attitude is going to be. But we need to be realistic. That's a new one, but I've... <laughs> Wait a minute, it's about 50 of these. That's a, that's, that's a new one, Dale. Wow. Um, in uh, Michigan, there's a group called People Not Politicians, and they're collecting signatures to put ferry districting on the ballot as a ballot initiative. Is that a pathway that's open to us here? No, even though, you know, we were the birth one of the birthplaces of the great progressive tradition. Uh, the progressive leaders in Wisconsin exported the idea of initiative referendum and failed to in, in, adopt it in, in their home state. Uh, so yes, California can do it, Arizona can do it, Michigan can do it, but we can't. But we can do, but that, that's, that's an issue's referendum who would have the force of law. So if the referendum passes, that's the law. Uh, we can't do that, but we can have advisory referendums. and. Um, and sometimes some um, elected officials watch those results. And so if you, you can get advisory referendums on the ballot and have at different levels of government. And, um, and I, think, I think that's worth, worth the effort. effort. Um, uh, we've had a number of them pass. Yeah. And on this issue, we've had them pass. Yeah. Yes, we did it here, didn't we? Did we have it on Rock County's ballot and yeah, I voted yes for, yeah. 2016, November of 16. Yes, that's right. I, I uh, teach juniors government at Blake Turner High School, and I would to to the conversation about how do you make people care about this. Um, they, my students in the past have actually drawn me as a stick character on a high horse named gerrymander because it just drives me crazy. And I, I, I don't try to teach partisan at all, but um, this is an issue I, I'm willing to kind of go down that road with. And 
once you kind of explain it as a fairness issue, and for conservative students as a competitiveness issue, um, they, they just wrap their heads around it right away. And then it's just, why is this something that we allow at all in our democracy? And so I think, you know, to that people outside of this room that might not be interested in it, I think that, that there's definitely an avenue to, uh, to pursue this. So that's, I just want to make that comment. So how do we get our legislature to go to the Iowa system? How, how does that actually happen? Well, we, we, all, all things happen. The legislature has to, has, has to vote yes. Um, and um, that, that's, not in the, that's not in the very near future. Um, but um, uh, Iowa was, was, um, was, was, was forced into doing something by the Supreme, their Supreme Court, and they, that was their solution. Um, that's not likely to happen here either. I mean, this is a, that's why I like to point out the women's vote issue. I, mean, it's, I hope this doesn't take 72 years, um, but it's gonna take a while, and the gentleman over here is not too far off on what the, what the likely um, gentleman in the blue shirt is. That's, the, that's sort of the reality of this thing. Um, and people can say, well, that's partisan to be talking about having to have split government by having a Democratic governor, um, but it's also was partisan to, to create the situation where that's one of the only solutions. Well, and, and as, as every good civics teacher is going to tell their students, we have three branches of government to serve as a check and a balance on each other. To suggest that somehow or another with somebody with all the power is going to willingly give that up is just naive. That's why we have the Supreme Court to, to say what you're doing is unconstitutional. And they have said that and they have made other statements about things that are important to our elections. And we're now approaching a, a moment of truth where uh, we think we've presented a case to those of us who support this effort uh, that sets a standard, because I, I agree, I don't think that the court should willy-nilly wander into po politics, but if they really do believe in symmetry, if they really do believe that there are unconstitutional gerrymanderings, then they should help find a standard. There are all kinds of mathematicians around this country that have suddenly taken interest in this. In fact, there's going to be a symposium on the Madison campus uh, uh, where mathematicians will be uh, working with one another and talking about this. So this isn't the only standard. It's one that the plaintiffs uh, chose. Uh, I happen to think it's a pretty good one, but it's, it's not the only thing driving this, this lawsuit as the the attorneys who presented this to the Supreme Court pointed out. Well, I don't see there are any other hands up. Are there anyone else? We don't want to foreclose anybody an opportunity. I just want to say I asked who looks out here. Front and fall down if anybody wants to pick up the blue Oh, I'm going to grab one of those. Nobody's sending me one. Yeah, yeah go ahead. He, she's bringing the microphone. Um, the, the symposium was uh, a week ago, I think, uh, for the mathematicians. They, they gathered from all across the country, and one of their goals is to try to find other mathematical measures, and one in particular, you can't measure intent so far. So one of their goals is to sort of find mathematical ways of measuring intent. You know, uh, I don't know how they're going to do it, but... Uh, that would be uh, one way to go, but my question to you and maybe um, uh, your opinion of the Supreme Court, I think uh, Justice Roberts was claiming it was a little high level um, with mathematical standards. Um, is this too wonky, you know, to, to go that deep into the mathematics of map, make, map making or districting? No, because they, they, they did it with the intent they had in Wisconsin. I, I realize it's hard for me to measure the in, intent in your mind on a particular topic, but on this, for example, but on this one, um, you, you can measure intent by looking at the result. The result clearly shows what the intent was, and that's what, that's what the, the three-judge panel in Wisconsin said. Um, they, they had a four-day trial in Madison. They, they dug into this thing big time. Uh, so it's... It, it can be measured. If, if you can find people who, who, can, who can 
use the analytics to gerrymander to help one party, you can use the same analytics to make sure that you draw a map that doesn't help just one party. I go back again. We're, we're, the, the, the best we're going to get probably is 25 um, competitive districts, but that's that's what we used to have, and um, our legislature sw would swing back and forth uh, as a result of it. I think the state senate swept back in, in one of the 90s and the early 2000s. I think it's changed four times. More than that. Is it more than that? But it, you know, it's not a case of again trying to get competitive seats. It's just making sure the absence of intent is is what we're hoping for. I, and I think we can get there. It, it, I only point that out because it's of interest. You know, the United States Supreme Court, what did that uh, hearing last? A, an hour, half hour? Well, obviously, you know, they're going to pick some questions. I don't know how they do that. But what I've always been told is don't read too much into what you think the justices are thinking when they ask the questions. Uh, I really believe uh, that we, we have a good chance of having more than a 5-4 decision here. Thank you all for being here. This says a lot about this community and, and its uh, concern for government. Uh, it really is a pleasure and a privilege to, uh, to be with you tonight. I just want to let everyone know that to find more information, you can go to our website, lwvjvl.org, or find us on Facebook at Janesville League of Women Voters. Uh, thank you very much to Tim and Dale for coming this evening. Uh, we really appreciate their time, and we are the League is giving a contribution to the Fair Maps Project in their honor. So. Uh -oh. Okay, okay, all right. We just, I just, I, I understand now. We've done this all over the state. We have been offered very kindly by groups, uh, expenses and honorariums, and we've said no. We're doing this because we believe it's important, and, uh, and there are better uses for that money, but I think a contribution to the Fair Voting Project is entirely appropriate, and, and let me just say on their behalf, thank you. Uh, it, being here tonight is, is more than enough for the two of us. Thank you. <laughs>